In 1982, the St. Louis Cardinals charted a new course with their first winning season since 1976. They qualified for the playoffs for the first time in seven years. With one of the youngest teams in the NFL, head coach Jim Hannafin has molded a winner. In three seasons under Hannafin, the Cardinals have become contenders. When the Big Red traveled to Green Bay to meet the Packers, their inexperience caught up with them. Despite more first downs and more total yards than the Packers, plus an NFL record-breaking passing performance by Neil Lomax, the Cardinals lost in Green Bay. But the Big Red's final touchdown signaled more than the end of a turnaround season. It signaled a new beginning as well. For the Cardinals have developed more than just the physical skills to become a winner. I'm very proud of them. I'm proud of the fact that they have found out to fight through adversity, keep on hanging in there, keep on scratching away and plugging away. You know, it's something that all coaches say to their team, hey, if you'll do that, good things will happen to you. Well, a couple of good things have happened to them, and it's what I'm excited about. It's happened to them when they were very, very young, and it bodes well for the future. The word is out in the NFL. The St. Louis Cardinals have issued an alert. The Big Red is on the verge of championship contention. Indeed, the Big Red have sounded a red alert. On opening day in New Orleans, the St. Louis Cardinals met the improved New Orleans Saints. But an equally improved Big Red defense forced four turnovers and limited the home team to a single last-minute touchdown. When Neil Lomax spotted Pat Tilly for a final fourth-quarter score, the Cardinals had earned their first win of the new season, 21-7. After a promising start, the Cardinals returned home to face Art out of contention. And when an NFL player strike halted play, St. Louis fans would have to wait 57 days to discover if the 82 Cardinals were contenders or pretenders. But the winds of change had brought the Cardinals a new assistant head coach, a defensive specialist named Floyd Peters. You gotta understand you're a corner, babe. You're a corner. Let's stay. You guys are getting rattled out there. His sights were now set on pumping new life into a St. Louis defense that had allowed the most points in the NFC in 1981. Tackling was the biggest problem they had. Attitude was another thing, quitting and giving up on the thing. And a general kind of disparity about they'd play well for a play or two, a series or two, maybe a quarter, but they wouldn't fight all the way through. So you have talent there. It's just getting them to play their best every Sunday. Most ball players will give you a chance to see if your package will work. But you better have some success along the way or you'll lose them real fast. Late in 1981, the Cardinals went from a 3-4 defensive alignment to a 4-3. Floyd Peters has kept and refined that four-man front, and the Cardinals immediately improved their sack total. What once was a negative is now a positive. The star of the rejuvenated pass rush is third-year end Curtis Greer, number 75. When the Cardinals employed a three-man front, Greer was frequently double teamed. Now, in one-on-one -on -one matchups, he's emerged as the team's best pass rusher. When the ball is snapped, the first thing I have in my mind is to get to the quarterback. Um, I play every down as a passing down and then react to the run. I think that's the reason I've had so much success rushing the quarterback this year, is that I react to the run secondly and go get the quarterback first. 1982 marked the third year in a row that Curtis Greer has either led or tied the Cardinals in sacks. 
But the new Red Rush is more than a one-on-one -on -one affair. Floyd Peters has installed a number of elaborate stunts that create more of a team pass rush concept. In the opener in New Orleans, tackle Mike Dawson, Elo Grooms, and Rush Brown got together on a coordinated effort that typifies the new look Big Red Rush. On another occasion, pressure by end Elo Grooms and strong safety Ken Green forced Saints quarterback Archie Manning out of the pocket, causing him to hurry his throw. That pressure allowed rookie free safety Benny Perrin to record his first interception in his NFL debut. We're almost there. I tell you what, we're going to have a little bit of growing pain. We're going to have our ups and downs until we get all the pieces really polished and put together. We're playing on a lot of hustle and desire and getting after people and trying, but we still have a little stage to go to where we really make fewer mistakes. I really do scream and holler and get on the ball player. And I won't take lack of effort, but I think we're on the right track. I like that about Floyd. You know, he says, I'm going to holler at you and yell at you in the meeting, but just be a man about it. Let the water run off your back, and uh, we'll go out and play football the next day. In the 1981 season, the Cardinal defense frequently brought out the best in a team. Unfortunately, it was usually the other team. But under the guidance of Floyd Peters, the St. Louis defensive unit has responded not with outstanding individual efforts, but with a coordinated one. Their strength is in numbers. An aggressive gang tackling approach features Curtis Greer, Elo Grooms, Mike Dawson, and Rush Brown, along with Stafford Mays and Bruce Thornton up front, plus promising rookie David Galloway. Cornerback Roger Worley is retiring after 14 seasons in St. Louis and bids farewell to a secondary that includes Jeff Griffin, Carl Allen, Lee Nelson, and all-rookie team free safety Benny Parent. Capable support in the defensive backfield is provided by Ken Green, Dave Steef, Don Besselou, and Herb Williams. A young linebacking contingent made great strides under Floyd Peters, a group that spotlights E.J. Jr., Dave Ahrens, and Charlie Baker, backed up by Craig Pukey, Kurt Allerman, and John Gillen. There are no superstars in this outfit, yet, but there are 22 enthusiastic contributors on the brink of becoming a first-rate defensive unit. fun doing what we're doing and uh, you know I just hope that we can get better while we're doing it. Points that made the difference in the 23-20 Cardinal win. The playoff chase was on, and the Cardinals were part of it. A fixture on the St. Louis offensive line for over a decade has been six-time All-Pro Dan Deerdorf. In 1982, Deerdorf sacrificed his tackle position to a rookie and moved over to center. Let's go, Dan. Huh? Get him fired up. Hey, Again, up Deerdorf one. was hey. the leader of a line hey. that included Terry Steve, hey. Joe Bostic, Art Plunkett, George that, Collins, Randy Somebody. Clark, and Bob Seabro. Huh? Get them stoked up. 
as starters, two rookie tackles, Louis Sharp and Tootie Robbins. Both made the NFL's all-rookie team and had the pleasure of opening holes for O.J. Anderson. Despite missing a game in 1982, O.J. Anderson finished fourth in the NFC in rushing and added three more 100-yard games, bringing his team record total to 22. Already the Cardinals' all-time leading runner, Anderson has led the National Football Conference in rushing for the time he's been in the league. And he finished the season just 80 yards shy of 5,000 in a career that has spanned less than four full seasons. O.J. Anderson, a testament to consistency. At just 26 years of age, Anderson will provide plenty of power for the Big Red throughout the 1980s. In the week following the Atlanta game, Anderson was unable to suit up for a critical matchup against the Eagles in Philadelphia. His spot was turned over to Stump Mitchell, number 30, a second year back who was handed his first starting assignment as a pro. Filling Anderson's shoes was not an easy task. And a little advice from O.J. helped put the bite back in the Cardinal attack. That way you keep your legs fresh and go right back in there and give some more. It's your day. It's all on you. Neil Lomax and the Cardinal offense looked more and more to Mitchell, and number 30 carried the burden like a seasoned veteran. In perhaps the NFL's single most outstanding substitute performance of the year, Stump Mitchell shocked the Eagles by running for 145 yards and a touchdown, numbers that helped beat Philadelphia 23-20. Oh, yeah, hey, Stump Mitchell, along with Wayne Morris and Willard Harrell, provide more depth at running back than the Cardinals have enjoyed since the playoff years of the mid-70s. Stump Mitchell's performance in Philadelphia came as a surprise to some, but not to those who followed the Cardinals' ninth round pick in the 1981 draft. In his first year in St. Louis, Mitchell was named to the all-rookie team after he became the most prolific return man in Cardinal history. He stayed that course in 1982. Five foot eight inch Mitchell has extended his talents far beyond the limits of special team play as he proved in Philadelphia and against eight other NFL opponents in 1982. In the abbreviated season, number 30 averaged just under five yards a carry, over 13 yards a catch coming out of the backfield, and accounted for more total yards than any other Cardinal. Stump Mitchell is but one of a group of young Cardinals who have gained valuable playing experience in their first years in St. Louis. Another is quarterback Neil Lomax, who's benefited from the experience of Jim Hart's 17 years in the league. Like Hart, Lomax started several games in his rookie year. He then started every game in 1982. The only way to learn the game is to play it. But while experience is a good teacher, it seldom gives vacations. While attending this school of hard knocks, Lomax has matured and he's nurtured the poise that tells him when to stop the action and head to the sidelines for help. Neil, where did you feel the pressure on that 437? Well, what screwed me up was he came and then came off on juice. So In order that. for one to learn I'm from his mistakes, he must out. fully so understand I'm those errors. And, and with the up. patience okay. of the Cardinal coaching staff, Lomax can make the proper adjustments, climb back in the cockpit, and come out throwing. To run the post, work it. 
Fire him up, Neil, fire him up. With the help of several quality wide receivers like Mel Gray and Mike Schumann, and tight ends Doug Marsh, Greg LaFleur, and Eddie McGill, Neil Lomax grew more comfortable with the Big Reds' offensive scheme. And Lomax's poise paid off most when he led all NFC quarterbacks by throwing the fewest interceptions in 1982. Foremost among Cardinal pass catchers is Pat Tilly, the dependable wide receiver who led the team in receiving for the fifth consecutive year. As one of the NFL's premier possession receivers, Tilly extended his career figures to 321 catches, 4,780 yards, and 21 touchdowns. Tilly succeeds on grit and wit. He knows precisely when to bring a defensive back down and when to leave one behind. Tilly's counterpart at the other wide-out position may be the game's most versatile performer. A year ago, Roy Green, number 81, doubled as a defensive back and became the first player since 1957 to have an interception and a touchdown catch in the same game. In 1982, Green concentrated on one position, wide receiver, and gave clear indication that he's becoming one of the league's best. a jack of all trades now a master of one and in 1983 Roy Green and the Cardinals will again take wing seeking out a nesting place at the top of the NFC's Eastern Division two season rolled into December, the Cardinals had established themselves as primary contenders for a spot in the NFL's unique playoff tournament. By winning two of their last three games, a playoff spot would be theirs. And on a grim day in Chicago, the eyes of the Big Red focused on that goal. Against the Bears, the NFC's leading punter, Carl Birdsong, and the St. Louis special teams kept Chicago away from the Cardinal goal line, limiting the Bears to a single score. Then the Big Red got all the points they needed from running back Wayne Morris, number 24, and kicker Neil O'Donohue. A 48 yard field goal by Neil O'Donohue. Out of the hole of Roger Ruler, the ball is down, the kick is up. High. With 25 seconds on the clock, it is good! Neil O'Donohue from 48 yards away. The victory brought the Cardinals a step closer to their playoff goal. And when they took the field to face the New York Giants, Big Red fans said goodbye to two veterans playing their final game in St. Louis. After 12 years and 45 touchdown catches, Mel Gray took his final curtain call, and Roger Worley, after 14 years, closed out his career in dramatic fashion. Warner's going to run with it. Warner's down at the 15. First down, 10. Roger Warner, touchdown! Warner will to close out your final game in a Cardinal uniform.
the Cardinals erupted for a second touchdown on a Neil Lomax to Roy Green scoring pass and carried a 17-7 lead into the fourth period. But when the Giants struck for two quick touchdowns of their own, St. Louis suddenly found themselves behind with a minute seven to play. The Cardinals have to come from their 30 to the Giants end zone. Nothing in between will work. They have to get all the way in the end zone. A field goal is no good. A similar situation unfolded in 1963 when the Cardinals trailed Pittsburgh 23-17 with just 47 seconds left. Quickly, Charlie Johnson drove the cards the length of the field. And with just five seconds left, he spotted Bobby Joe Conrad. As time expired, Conrad crossed the goal line with the touchdown that won it 24-23. Now, some 20 years later, it was do or die again in St. Louis. And drops. Here comes the pressure. Stepping up, throwing right side, Roy Green. Caught! First down for Roy Green. Out of the shotgun, here comes the pressure. Lomax steps up and throws. It is caught! It is caught at the 79 line! All right. Okay, let's go I-439, huh? First and goal at the Giants' seven yard line! Takes the ball, drops, sets, looking, looking, still looking, still looking, rolling right, looking, throws, it's a touchdown! The right green, touchdown! The Big Red combined firepower with willpower to beat the Giants 24-21 and achieve their season-long goal, a spot in the playoffs. The win was a microcosm of the 1982 season, a year when the St. Louis Cardinals gathered together and grew as a football team. A renewed spirit surfaced in St. Louis that heralded their new identity. They sounded a red alert and established themselves as contenders. The 1982 NFL season was filled with bizarre events, and this was 82 season one of the wildest ever. Mark Henderson won't be coming to Bush Stadium in 1983, but plenty of top teams and talent will be. In the race for another playoff spot, the Cardinals welcome the defending Super Bowl champion Washington Redskins, featuring Joe Theismann, John Riggins, and a full complement of Hogs and Smurfs. Pro football's toughest, most competitive division, the NFC East, features, as always, the Dallas Cowboys, who take aim at their 18th consecutive winning season. The New York Giants and the Philadelphia Eagles round out the rest of the Big Reds' divisional competition. And then come the record-breaking San Diego Chargers, the innovative Minnesota Vikings, the Seattle Seahawks, and the San Francisco 49ers all-pro combination of Joe Montana and Dwight Clark. So be there at Bush Stadium when the action resumes in St. Louis.